while we're standing, let's open our hymnals to hymn number 214. 214, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. And we'll sing the first and the last verse this morning. 214. First and last verse.
but not for this church, but for the Philippines. Um, there's a church building in the Philippines. They're trying to build a church in a new area, and uh, they need our help with that. I was actually in touch with one of the brothers who was uh, working in that area. He was in Bible college with us in Australia, and he's working on that church there. So that'll be next Sabbath. We'll collect the offering for that, and then next Sabbath as well. At 2 p.m. here in Exclusive Church, we'll have, there will be choir practice at 2 p.m. So at this time, um, we were, we're going to have a special item, and we're blessed today because today is a special Sabbath, right? So we're going to have two special items, not only one, but two.
Isn't that a beautiful song, Tis Love That Makes You Happy? Well, you know what makes me happy this morning? Not only being here, but being able to introduce my oldest brother, Danny Ballback, as a speaker this morning. Uh, Danny's 13 and a half years older than me. But growing up, I remember just constantly praying for him. Constantly praying for him, even for the last 20 years. So that's a while, right? Even into my 20s, I was praying for him because he was living a complete different life. And maybe you'll hear about that a little bit this morning. But I would have never, ever, ever imagined in my entire life. Um, I was praying for him to come back to the Lord. But I would have never imagined that I would have had this opportunity to introduce him as a speaker and that he would be preaching. So this is really special to me. And I thank God for this opportunity. I thank God that I'm here. And I thank God that my brother's here. He's going to be preaching the sermon entitled this morning, Coming Home. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. I'm very happy to be here this morning. Um, just a little history uh, about me, and to make it personal, uh, those of you who know me or don't know me, I, I live in California, so I live on the other side of the coast. Uh, but I do have a lot of history from the East Coast. I was born in uh, Franklinville, New Jersey, and uh, lived there until I was about three and a half. And when I was there, we would come up sometimes to camp meetings up here in Canada. And I have just some small memories. I have a couple photos when I was about two or three being up here uh, at the Puslet Church. And I, I grew up there in Franklinville with... Um, some families that some of you that have been around for a while probably remember the Garbies, the Burek family. Um, and uh, when I moved to California, our church had no young people. I was the only young person. We had no young people. And every once in a while, I would come to a camp meeting in Canada or in Shahola, something like that. And then I was thankful to meet up with uh, uh, David Zick and the Bukatich boys, the Milliners. I'm happy to see Eric here today. Um, those were like the only times once every few years where I would have a little something social with, with other young people. <laughs> and so um, today I'm going to be sharing some, some things from my personal testimony. And there are some things that are, of course, that I did, which uh, you know we would think of as terrible. But I need to mention these things because um, otherwise you cannot understand how powerful our God is. So just please remember, in youth, of course, when I mention some of the things that I did or, you know, the times I went through, in no way am I condoning this. I just want to share God's power and how he can deliver you from these things. Um, the last time I was in Canada was 23 years ago. Last time I was here in Puslich was 26 years ago. Um, when I would come to these programs, I was happy to be with the youth. I loved the Lord, but... I was worldly. I didn't desire to be in these meetings. I had no enjoyment or pleasure from these meetings. Uh, the last time I was in Canada was in Toronto. I believe the church was just recently dedicated. And just to under, so you can understand where my mindset was in those days, I was 19 years old. Um, I would come, I would be with my group of friends, and we would go to church. We would be in church till about 12 o'clock. I think we would stay for lunch, and after that, we would disappear. Guess where we went? We'd go to the nearest bar. Yeah, on Sabbath. We'd go to the nearest bar, and we'd go bar hopping. And so we'd be drinking and smoking, and everybody was in church. And then we'd come back at the end of the day, and we probably use, between all of us, we'd use maybe a half a bottle of cologne. Just, I don't know why we uh, tried to cover up. But then we'd come back to the church. We'd sit in the church, you know. And, and we thought we had what was true. What's the name of this program, youth? Happiness. Happiness. We thought we had true happiness. But really deep inside, we didn't have happiness. We were looking for happiness. And so, because of this uh, story that I'm going to be sharing today... Joey, how do you reactivate? I'm using Joey's tablet. I do have an obsession. Okay. Okay. 
And because of this um, story that I'm going to be sharing today, um, we will understand, with the help of the Lord, what it means to have true happiness. And tomorrow we're going to have a workshop discussion, and we're going to understand what we think is worldly happiness and what's true happiness. Uh, I want to start out by asking everyone of you that's here, how many of us have been promised something special? Has anybody been promised something special, especially you young people, right? Do your parents promise you something special sometimes? Yeah, do you like promises? I do too. Well, remember this, keep this in mind, because a little bit later, I'm going to be sharing with you my favorite Bible promise, and how the Lord was able to bring that Bible promise to come true. Uh, today we're going to be um, hearing from my personal testimony as I make a parallel with a beautiful story in the Bible in chapter Luke, verse, uh, Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son. And as I continue, I want to ask us another question. Do you know what is the purpose of giving a testimony? What do you think the purpose of giving a testimony is for? Does anybody know? Do you think it's just to entertain people? So that we can hear an interesting story? How about, is it to satisfy someone's curiosity? You think that's the purpose of a testimony? What do you think? You know, the Bible tells us what the purpose of a testimony is. I'd like all of us to turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, and we're looking at verse 11. And the Bible says there, in Revelation 12, verse 11, And they, speaking of the 144,000... And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Brothers and sisters, we can see from this verse here that there is power in telling your testimony. There, it is God's way of giving us overcoming power through the experience of someone else. And I would like to state here today that I'm not the only one who has a testimony. Each and every one of you should have a testimony, and we need to share it for the honor and glory of God. And it's my prayer that by hearing um, the story of God's saving grace and power as he worked in my life, that you may gain strength from this story today to overcome challenges that you may be facing. Amen. I was raised in a wonderful and conservative Christian home. I had everything one could desire. My parents raised me perfectly according to Bible standards. But like the prodigal son, I soon became tired of the restraint at my father's house. I felt my freedom was being restricted. Do we ever feel like that sometimes, young people? A little bit? I misunderstood my parents' love and care. And I thought that I was being held back from true fun and... What's the name of our program? Happiness. Happiness. That's what I thought I was being held back from. And so with this mindset, I decided to take my inheritance early and go seek what I thought was real pleasure. Now let us turn to a well-known story in the Bible. Luke chapter 15 and verses, we're going to read verses 11 through 13. As we make the parable here. Luke 15, 11 through 13, and the Bible says, And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Brothers and sisters and young people, I want to share with you today that just like this story, I did the same thing. I took a road away from my proper biblical upbringing, and I went towards a road of foolishness and destruction. Now, I want to share that my inheritance was not necessarily a monetary one. When we read the story in the Bible, we only think of a monetary inheritance. But my inheritance was one of certain qualities of life such as my years of life, my youth, my strength, my intellect, and my spiritual aspirations. This was my inheritance that I took early. 
And the Bible has another name for these qualities. Back to Luke chapter 15, verse 13, the last part. It says, and there he wasted his, what? Substance. I want to ask you, what is substance? Does anybody know what substance is? This is very important, especially young people. You need to know what your substance is because the enemy wants you to waste it. Do you know today what your substance is? First of all, let's understand the word. Substance is actually two words. We have the word sub and the word stance. Now, what does sub mean? What does submarine mean? Okay. Not this, and what does subway mean? Not the Subway sandwich. That's one of my wife's favorites. <laughs> but it means below, beneath, right? How about subtract? Sub-zero, below zero. So we understand that the word means sub. Now what does sub means below? Now what does stance mean? Stance is something very important if you are a what? A boxer. Why? Because if you have a poor stance, and you stand straight like this, and you have another guy who's got a good stance, which is the one, I know we don't bet, but which is the one that you would, you would be rooting for? The one who has a good what? Stance. And so young people, substance is the thing that you are standing on. Another word for it is foundation. Does that make sense? Did you know that the enemy wants to destroy and steal your foundation? What was the thing that the young man wasted? His substance. And you know what your foundation is? It is all the wonderful principles that your mother and your father has taught you. Loving God, doing right to others. These are things that when you go to college and school today, guess what the school is equipped with from the enemy? a hammer and a chisel, and they want to chisel out your foundation because if you don't have a good foundation, how good are you going to be in the fight? Right? Okay. So now that we understand that, I want to share that the enemy started to attack my substance. At the age of 18, I started going to bars and nightclubs. I started drinking and smoking, and it was little by little. I would go to the bars and the nightclubs, and I would only drink and smoke at the nightclubs. And then I would go to work, and I was a successful young man. And I said, I'm not addicted because I'm only drinking and smoking when I'm going to the nightclubs. Remember, the enemy never comes strong. He comes very, very slow. Pretty soon, little by little, all these things started to take control of my life before I realized it. And soon I became addicted and involved with alcohol, drugs, gangs, and organized crime. And I started to realize something in my life when it was too late. Let's take a look at Proverbs chapter 5, verse 22. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 22. We actually have this Bible verse where? Proverbs 5, verse 22. We have this Bible verse, it happened to so be in our lesson for this morning. Proverbs 5, verse 22, and this is how I felt. This is what I realized, brothers and sisters. It says, his own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be what? Holden with the cords of his sin. And this is exactly how I felt. Let me tell you something, young people, about the enemy. Once he has you in this position, he no longer needs to deceive you. You already know that you're under the control of the enemy, and I knew that, and I knew that I was a slave to the enemy. And he doesn't mind to reveal to you at that time that you're a slave of his. You know why? Because you can do nothing in and of yourself to release yourself. And it's a very, very scary situation. I became held with the cords of my sin. I became a slave to my own addictions. The, own, the same things that I thought would bring me what? True fun and what? Happiness. Happiness. During this time, my parents continued to pray for me. It was later told to me by Brother Livio that my father had stated, I love my son so much, and with tears in his eyes, because of the condition that I was in, my father said, I would be willing to do anything that it took, even if my son was in a pit of dung, in the deepest, darkest, dirtiest pit, I would go down there, do anything I could to go down there and pull him up 
and bring him to be with me. My mother would daily claim Bible promises in regards to me for years and years. And it was only until my baptism that she shared a testimony. And with tears in her eyes, she shared some of the verses that had empowered her to keep having faith. Can we look at a few of those today? Would you like to look sure. at some of those? And write these down, parents. These are ones that you need to memorize, especially if you have children that maybe have gone into a different path. Isaiah 29, verse 25. Isaiah 29, verse 25. These are powerful verses. Isaiah 29. I'm sorry, 49. Isaiah 49, verse 25. And the Bible tells us here. But thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. Who's the terrible? The enemy. Who was the prey? I was the prey. The Bible says, speaking of God, for I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will what? Save thy children. So my mother would just hold on to this. I will save thy children. And this is... This is the faith that she had as she was saying, she was saying that. And the reason why this was so dear to her is because I had many, many near-death experiences. Many, many times an enemy tried to take my life. I'm just going to share a short one. One day I was about 22 or 23 years old. I had gone into a bar and I was by myself. I was heavily intoxicated with alcohol and other drugs. And uh, just to make a long story short, an altercation occurred. And I was asked to step outside to engage into a, into a fist fight. Because of my, my state, I didn't realize that the person that I went outside with was a gang member. I was by myself, and he had five other friends that were there with him. So when I went outside to fight him, before you know it, I'm surrounded by six people. Because I was so tall, they were going to teach me a lesson. So long story short, immediately I got put on the ground because you just, you just cannot overpower six people. And when I was in the ground, because of my intoxicated state, I was numb, which means I felt nothing. That's the effect of the alcohol and the drugs. I felt nothing. So instead of protecting my head, I just tried to push myself up. And so for three and a half minutes, my whole head was exposed. And these guys had steel toe boots. And for three and a half minutes, they kicked my head in like a soccer ball. And they were going to kill me. They were going to kill me. <clears throat> I came home that day, praise the Lord, I didn't even go to the hospital. Finally, finally, there was someone that stopped, there was somebody that stopped the fight, otherwise I, I would have died. Someone that knew me there, they stopped the fight after three and a half minutes, my head was swollen like a, like a, like a huge soccer ball. I went home and I remember, uh, I went into the room right away because my mom knew something was wrong and she wanted to see me and I didn't want her to see me, you know. I locked myself in the room and she was crying and crying. Long story short, I just, within a couple days, maybe two, three days later, the swelling went down. I was back at drinking and everything was terrible. My eyes were bloodshot. I uh, went to my friends that were drinking and, and doing all the things that I did. And about two weeks later, I went to work and I went to the bathroom and I went to work and I looked in the mirror and I looked and I realized that wasn't me because the swelling went down and there was dents in my head all over the place. I went to the doctor. They did me a CAT scan. The doctor brought me into my, brought me into her office. And she looked at me. She said, "Do you believe in God?" I said, "Yes, I do." She said, "Well, he must be looking out for you because I've never seen anything like this in my life. You have 30 break 30 to 40 breaks and fractures in your frontal lobe." She said, "It is a miracle that you are alive." She said, one more kick in your head would have popped like a watermelon. She said, we're going to do the best that we can to repair your face. And so I had a surgery. It's called a face-off surgery. And you can probably see the scar on my head. It goes from here. It goes all the way. And then it goes to here. And what they do is they, they basically cut my head and they peeled it back. And uh, they put two titanium plates in my head with 32 screws in order to try to tie it back together. This is just one of the many near-death experiences that I had. But you see, my mom had faith. She knew that the enemy had a lot to contend with because the day I was born, guess what my parents did? 
They dedicated me to the Lord for him and for his service, just like Hannah dedicated Samuel to the Lord for his service. So my mom had faith because she knew that no matter what the enemy tried, God would not lose his own. I was dedicated by Brother Brother Dubai. For those of you that remember the great, late Brother Dubai. Let's look at another one of my mother's Bible, uh, favorite Bible promises. Jeremiah 32, verse 27. Jeremiah 32, verse 27. The Bible says here, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything too hard for me? Let me tell you something. What Mikey said was true, and it wasn't just what Mikey said, where he said he never knew, he never could think, even though he, he had what he called faith. Many people didn't believe people from the church. They said, it will never happen. We know, Danny, he's, he's gone too far. But my mother claimed to these promises. She said, no, it's possible because the Lord said, nothing is too hard for me. Aren't these be uh, verses beautiful? Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. As my mother claimed these verses and the enemy tried to take my life, she had faith that the enemy would not prevail because she had dedicated me to the Lord. I want us now to return to the story of the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15, verse 14 through 17. Luke chapter 15, verse 14 through 17. It says here, And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? Brothers and sisters, just like the story of the prodigal son, I came to a point in my life where I hit rock, rock bottom, where you're at the worst of the worst. And I want to explain to you a little bit about how bad this is. Do you think this was bad for the prodigal son? What was he doing? He was feeding what? Do you know how terrible that was for a Jew? That was the worst of the worst of the worst. And not only was he feeding them, he was what? He was happy if he could eat what they were eating. He probably was happy to sleep where they were sleeping. So I was living in the Sacramento area, in an area called Rio Linda. It's like a rural area. And uh, this was, once again, where I hit basically rock bottom. I was staying with some friends, and we had... Uh, we basically had a metal shed that we rented from somebody. We had no restroom, no shower. And so when we would use the bathroom, when we have to go number two to the bathroom, we would use uh, like a five-gallon paint bucket. And then we just put a plastic bag there. We'd use the bathroom, tie it up, we'd dig a hole. That, that's, that was, for me, living in the swine pen, right? The worst of the worst. You know how I would live every day? How I would support my drug habit? There was an Air Force base right nearby that had closed down and it was full of commercial buildings. Because it was right there, every night we would go there and we'd, we'd cut the AC units, we'd rob the AC units off the top of the buildings and just push them off onto our flatbed truck so we could take out the copper. We'd scrap the copper. The next morning we'd do the same thing. Just want to explain a little bit. Um, well, before I do that, I want to share that I came to a point when I was at rock bottom, Romans 7.24. Romans 7.24. This is, this is how I felt. Like I said, when you're in the cause of the enemy, you know it, and you wish you could do it yourself. And I felt like it says in Romans 7.24, the Bible says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? You know it's impossible, especially without the Lord. You see, I was 35 years old, 35 years old, I had no money, I had no car, I had no home, I had no place to go. I had been addicted to tobacco, marijuana, and alcohol for 17 years. And to crystal methamphetamine for 9 years. I just want to say something about crystal meth. Once again, I'm not here to glorify anything that's, that's of the enemy. I just want you to understand what a powerful thing the Lord has done. For those of you who don't know, crystal meth is one of the worst of the drugs. It's right up there with heroin. Okay, it's crystal meth and marijuana. It's on a total different level. On crystal meth, you will stay awake for one month with no sleeping. 
And because you're not sleeping, your mind doesn't function right. And because you're on the crystal meth, uh, the drug, what it does, it amplifies your dopamine by 10 times. So when you're doing something that you would normally do, it is 10 times more enjoyable to you, supposedly. Remember, this is false happiness. And what happens is when you try to quit the crystal meth, guess what happens? Your normal dopamine is way below what it used to be because it's used to this fake dopamine enhancer. And so you quit it and you have no desire for what? For life. So what do you do? It's a trap. What do you do? I go back to what can help me. You understand? And so that's why like 96% of meth addicts never recover. Because they always never get back to that level where they were. It's a terrible, terrible drug. All these things had taken their toll on me. And just prior to hitting rock bottom, I heard that dad was diagnosed with advanced glioblastoma, which is one of the rarest forms of brain cancer that only has a 2% survival rate. And when I heard this about dad, my heart sunk. Dad was the dearest person on this earth to me. And I decided, when I heard that, I decided, I'm going to forsake all my evil ways. So that while Dad is still alive, he could see me return to my godly upbringing. But as hard as I tried, I could not in and of myself do it. The enemy's grasp was too strong. During this time of Dad being sick, Somebody asked him, I don't know who it was, maybe Brother Libby or someone, I need to find out. They asked him, they said, Paul, and you have to remember, you know my dad, he was a big man, he was about 260 pounds, six foot four, and um, thank you. And uh, he, he went down to 100 pounds after his surgery, and it hurt me so much to see him, and somebody asked him, they said, Paul, what are you going to do if your son doesn't come back to the Lord before you pass away? And my dad looked him straight in the face, and he said, well, then maybe my death will bring him back. And if that is what it takes, then it's well worth it. And as I tried to release myself from the grip of sin while dad was still alive, I started coming back to church in the condition that I was in, you know, being addicted to drugs and everything. And I was coming back to church, and dad was in Roanoke, and you know how news travels in the church, so... I found out later, but um, I would call mom, and while I was going to church, I'd call mom and say, how is that? He's doing a little better. He's improving. He's doing a little better. And then guess what would happen? Sometimes the enemy would stop me. I couldn't make it to church. I want to, but I just couldn't. And after two, three weeks of not getting to church, you know, I'd call mom, how's dad? He's going down, son. He's going down. I don't know how long it's going to be, but he, he's not going to last long. And then I'd go back to church and I'd call mom, how's that? He's improving a little bit. And someone told me later, every Sabbath when you're in church, we call over the other side of the United States and we let your dad know that your son was in church. And guess what I realized? There was a direct correlation, a relation between me going to church and my dad's life. And I realized that my dad was hanging on to life because he wanted to see me come back. And when he had those little glimpses of faith, you know, it revived him. And when I didn't show up, it just it couldn't bear it. it. couldn't bear it. And I shared this with a friend of mine. And uh, my friend said, well, you know, he was an addict too, but he, he, he also was a Christian. And I, I was still a believer the whole time I had this problem. Um, and he told me, you know what, why don't you just fake it? Why don't you just pretend? Why don't you just get baptized and make your dad happy? And I said, I can't do that. I can't do that. And so long story short, I, I, I wanted to try to go back to church because I thought I could save my dad, you know. And I tried and I tried and it didn't happen. And one day I got the phone call and it was too late. I got the call. And after dad passed away, just I went through hard times. Of course, I was sad, but um, it just so happened that I had gone through hard times and I was really at the rock, rock, rock bottom of my life. Um, my car broke down and I used to uh, buy and sell antiques and I also bought and sold drugs. And without a car, you really can't get around. You can't do your, your thing. 
so you can't support yourself. And so I was staying on someone's couch, and after the drugs dried up, you know, they liked me, but they said, hey, I'm sorry, you know, it's time to go. Well, I was taking some medication to deal with anxiety at that time, and um, I knew if I didn't have my medication and being homeless without a car and everything, I knew things were going to get rough. And so what I did is I called my grandmother, and I said, Grandma, can you please take me to get my medication? She said, sure. So we had to go to this place out. It was like 40 minutes away, and my grandma took me to get my medication. We were there at the doctor, and we got there too late because it was a free clinic because I didn't have insurance. I wasn't in the system, as you call it. And we got there too late, and we were there till like 3 p.m., and then the doctor called us, and he said, you know what, sorry, you need to go through these other processes, and you guys came at 10, you need to be there at 8, and I knew that. He said, I'm sorry, I can't give you your medication today, and I needed that medication bad. And I looked at my grandma, and I said, Grandma, can you please bring me back tomorrow? But, you know, she was old, she was 80-something, and it was hard for her. And um, she said, don't worry, I'll bring you back tomorrow. So we were going back to where... Um, where I was staying, and she's like, okay, you want me to drop you off? And I said, actually, Grandma, you know what? Um, you can't drop me off here. I only had one other place to go. It was a terrible, terrible drug house, even for me. Um, and I didn't want to go there, and I said, well, Grandma, you know what? I, you know what? I have nowhere to go. She said, well, you know what? Why don't you come to our home tonight? Call Grandpa, ask him if you can come to our home tonight, and um, I'll take you in the morning. But see, my family, they loved me, but as long as I was living that lifestyle, they didn't accept that, of course, you know. I didn't want to call Grandpa. Many of you know my Grandpa. He's, he's a good man. He's funny, but he's tough. And I just didn't want to deal with him. So I just said, um, that's okay, Grandpa. Just drop me off at the house. She said, no, no, no. Call your Grandpa. I said, no, no, no. It's fine. She said, call him. So I called him. Hello, Grandpa. Yeah. Told him. He said, okay, for one night? I said, one night. He said, okay, one night only. Okay. So I go home with Grandma, Grandma arrive at the home. Um, that night I eat, I sleep. Remember, I'm on this drug where you don't eat, you don't sleep. I'm not using the drug. I eat, I sleep. I wake up in the morning. We're at the breakfast table about ready to go to the doctor because we have to leave early. And my Grandpa's at the end of the, end of the table and he's like, damn, you know, we've been down this road before. Why don't you, you know, I'm not saying give your heart to the Lord or anything like that. I'm not saying go to a rehab center. I'm saying why don't you try a lifestyle center. They have these places, they're called lifestyle centers, and maybe they can help you. Why don't you go to that? And I told him, no, I'm, I'm not ready for that. Because, you know what, I didn't want to quit the drugs. I didn't want to. And he said, well, think about it. I said, okay. So my grandma took me to get my medication. And while she took me to get my medication, guess who started working in my mind? The Holy Spirit. But he started working in a way that I could comprehend. And so this is the plan that I formulated with the help of the Holy Spirit while I was there. I realize I'm 35, I have absolutely nothing. When I come back, even with my medication, without a car, I won't be able to do anything. I won't be able to even survive on my drugs. I'm going to be homeless literally on the street. And so I knew that if I went to the Lifestyle Center for two weeks, that my mom... And my grandfather would buy me a car. I knew that. I just knew that that's how things would go. She says, I hoped. I knew her pretty good. So I knew that that's how it would go. So I said, you know what? I need to go to that lifestyle center just so what? Just so I could get a car so I could go out and be a better addict. Can you, understand? you have to understand this is how an addict thinks. You understand? But the Holy Spirit used this. Okay? This was the beginning of the Holy Spirit working in my heart. So I came home that night. I had decided I'm going to go to accept their offer because I need a car so I can go do drugs even better. So I came home. I went to sleep again. I ate good. No drugs. I woke up in the morning. I'm eating breakfast. Remember, two nights of sleep, two days of good meals, two days of no drugs. My mind is starting to what? Clear. And I talked to Grandpa. I said, you know what, Grandpa? Um... I think I'll take you up on your offer. He was happy. He called my mom and my brother right away. They were working, working, working. Little did I know, my mom already had a place lined up. White Creek Wellness Center in Tennessee couldn't take me because they were booked. But she already had found another place already. And so what happened is I, I told Grandma, okay, I'm going to go. And 
after I told him I'm going to go, I was thinking in my mind, you deceiver. You know you're going to go just to get a car so you can do drugs again. But you know what? The Holy Spirit kept working on my heart. And the Holy Spirit told me, you know what? Aren't you sick of this lifestyle? You're 35. You got nothing. Don't you want to get all these monkeys off your back for once and for all? Not to be spiritual or be going to church or anything like that, but maybe try to get sober. And you know what? I took that offer from the Holy Spirit. And I said, you know what? I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to try. I don't know if it's possible. I probably won't make it because I had tried rehab before. But I'm going to try. I'm going to give it my all. And if I get sober, I get sober. If not, I didn't lose anything. But I'm really going to try. That's the mentality I went with. So two days later, I was on an airplane. And I showed up in Tennessee in a little remote town. It's called Ironside, Tennessee. It's um, a Wildwood Lifestyle Center. It wasn't the one in Georgia. They have another sub outlet. It's called Butler Creek today. Ironside, Tennessee, right on the border of Alabama. It's about 300 acres, a beautiful place in the country. We pulled up there, and um, I go to the place. I go to the meals. They're super, super healthy. I can't stand them because I'm coming off the drugs, and I'm just craving, like, junk food, sugar, uh, oily, greasy things, uh, fattening things, this kind of stuff, and they don't use sugar, salt, or oil. And so I just couldn't stand it. But, you know, I was hungry and tired because I was off the drugs. And I didn't sneak any drugs because I said, I'm going to give it a try. And so guess what I did for the first week? I ate, and guess what else you think I did? Sleep. And slept. So for the first week, I would just eat and sleep. I'd eat and sleep, eat and sleep. They asked me to come down to worship in some of the programs, and I just, I just couldn't. I was recuperating. While I was there, I, I noticed a young man, he had a tattoo on his arm, and he volunteered at the place. And so I figured he had, a, like, an experience similar to mine. And I started talking to him, and he told me, hey, you know, yeah, I came here, and I volunteered, and I used to be into drugs, not as heavy as me, but like alcohol and marijuana, those things. He was from Bermuda. And he said, um, you know, in this place, it's helped me. And so I built a little friendship with him. And after one week, there was a, a guest who came, because most of the guests were Seventh-day Adventists, and they had problems, they weren't addicts like me. They had problems with like high blood pressure, uh, hypertension, uh, being overweight, diabetes, and they wanted to help, help with these things. And this guest, he was a military man, his name was Mike, and he said, Daniel, because we got to be friends at the table, you know, because that was the only time I was interacting with people, because I would just eat and sleep. He said, Daniel, why don't you come for a walk with us after the meal? And I said, okay. And I went with him on the walk, and he said, well, Daniel, you know, what, what actually brings you here? You see? Okay, you know? And I told him, well, I'm a, I'm a crystal meth addict, you know? And uh, I came here to try to sober up. And I told him how it happened, and I told him, you know, the my testimony up till then, he said, wow, that's amazing. He said, praise the Lord, Daniel. He said, you know what? You need to come to worship tonight. And I said, okay, because he was, you know, he was a nice person. So I ended up going to worship, and they used the old SDA hymnals. You remember the old SDA hymnals from the 1950s? They're, they're very, the hymns are like the ones from our Reform hymnal. And so they used those hymnals, and guess what they started singing that night? They started singing the old songs that I remember as a child. And I, I opened that hymnal, and I started looking at the words, and just tears started falling down my eyes. And I just started opening up to the Holy Spirit. He was softening me even more. And at the end of the night, that night, he continued to talk to me. The Holy Spirit told me, Daniel, you know what? You first came here because you wanted to deceive your parents. You wanted to get a car and go back to drugs. Then you decided to try to get sober and sober only. But the Holy Spirit told me, Daniel, don't you want to give your heart to me? Don't you want to have this peace in your life just like these other people that are here? And I said, yes, Lord, I do. And so from that point now, I had progressed to the third step. Now I want to give my heart to the Lord. A few days went on. We were at a worship. And I was thinking what I, a commitment I had made. And I thought I have to give up this, 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 this. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. These two things, I never thought about. Those two things, Lord, you know what? I can give you up all this, but not these two things. You know, these two things I cannot give up. And the Lord's like, Daniel, no, you have to give up everything. 
said, Lord, I can't give those things up. So what were those things? That was my music and my jewelry. So I liked hip-hop music, um, and I didn't want to give that up. And I liked jewelry. Uh, I used to wear a lot of bling-bling. I don't know if some of you remember that. It was an era where they used to call it bling-bling. That's what they call it in the world. Where you wear a lot of chain. I'd wear a lot of real jewelry, and I, I took pride in it. You know, and because of my height and because of the lifestyle that I lived, um, when you're in that lifestyle, it's called the game out there in the world. It's not a game, though, believe me. Um, you, you, you need to make a name for yourself. And so I, I had that jewelry, and because of my height, and because I always had things on me that people liked, you know, I'd walk into the room, and I'd be noticed right away, and I got that attention. And so that jewelry was like, part of me was a idol. You understand? And the Lord knew that. And I said, Lord, I don't want to de depart with that. I, I love that. God said, no, Daniel, you have to give me everything. And so what happened is, thanks to the Lord, he won, and I said, Lord, I will give you everything. A couple days later, I was still at the Lifestyle Center. By this time, I was going to the meetings. I was going to worships. The Lord was working into my heart. And guess what happened? Um, we were coming back from a walk in the woods, and a young man was walking down the path. This is like two weeks after I came to the place. And he's going like this, looking everywhere and walking real fast. And I looked at him and I said, druggy. <laughs> I knew it was a crystal meth I said, druggy, what's he doing here? Remember, this is two weeks later. And he walked by me. He goes, hey, how you doing? What's going on? You know. I said, ah, nothing. You know. He walked by me. And as I kept going, the Lord stopped me in my tracks. He said, Daniel, what are you doing? Don't you realize that was you two weeks ago? And he walked up, and the two people that were behind me were volunteers from the place, and they were like what you call uh, like holy rollers. They had never done anything wrong in their life. Their parent, one, one young man, he told me his parents said that the only thing he did wrong was he played on the stairs. And his mom said, don't play on the stairs. So here you have this young man, he's looking for help, right? And he's going to go to these two people that don't have an experience in the area he needs help. And the Holy Spirit told me, you need to go back there and help that young man. And I grudgingly said, okay. And I turned around and I went back over there and I said, hey, how you doing? My name's Daniel. And he told us his story at got in a fight with his wife at the liquor store. She told him to walk home, and he was passing by the Lifestyle Center. His life was full of drugs and addiction, alcohol, and he said he, he knew that the Lifestyle Center could help people like that, and he was going to ask them for help, but the president wasn't there. And I told him my testimony, and I said, well, look, hey, by then my heart had softened. I said, look, we're going to pray for you, and with God's help, you can get, you can get help. And we, we bowed our heads, and we prayed, and I prayed a prayer, and he started crying. And when we were done, I gave him a hug. And I said, look, we love you. And I said, get back in contact with the president. He will help you. As we were walking away, the two other young people that were with me, they said, Daniel, how did you pray such a prayer like that? They said, that was the most beautiful prayer I've ever heard. I said, I don't know. It wasn't me. We continued in the house that next Friday. We heard the president say that a young man had called him looking for help. And uh, he gave his phone number and to pray for him. And that evening, I talked to my friend Justin, the kid with the tattoo that we were friends with. And I said, hey, Justin, that's the kid. I, that's the guy that I met on the walk. Tell you what. Let's call him up and invite him to church. Can you imagine two weeks later now what, I want, what do I want to do? Missionary work, right? Isn't that wonderful how the Lord works? Mm -hmm. So we called him up. I said, hey, this is Daniel. You met me on the you know, way back over here. Would you like to come with us to church? He said, sure. We took him to church that day. There was a baptism. It was the most wonderful thing. He was crying through the program. Long story short, uh, on that story, about three weeks later, I went to Virginia. I went home and... The, man, the man's wife called me and said, look, uh, this, this, my husband, he needs help. Can you help him? I said, yes, I could, because I knew we had a place at White Creek Wellness Center. I said, um, 
Let me call him. She, I said, where is he? She said, he's in the bar. I said, well, how am I going to go? And she said, call the bar. She gave me the number to the bar. I called the bar right there in Alabama. Called the bar. He was at the bar. I talked to him. I said, look, hey, I'm willing to help you. I can take you. I remember, I was sober now. I, can, I had a car. By the way, I got the car. <laughs> yeah. um, my brother took me to go buy it. He helped me with some of the money, too, I think. My mom, of course. I took the car, and I was here in Virginia, and I picked him up, and we went all the way to White Creek Wellness Center. Now, two weeks later, I'm doing missionary work. We get to White Creek Wellness Center, and praise be to God, that young man was helped. He overcame his addictions, and he went back home. After that experience, the Holy Spirit went one step further and said, Daniel, at first you wanted to come to me just to get a car. Then I convicted you to come to me to get sober. Then I convicted you to give me your whole heart. And now I want to ask you if you will serve me and serve me for the rest of your life doing what you did to help that young man. And I said, yes, Lord, I will. Going on, I want to... Finish reading the verses in Luke chapter 15, 18 through 22. Luke 15, 18 through 22. The Bible says here, I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the father said unto him, Father, I have, the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put the ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you today that I have come home. Praise be to the Lord. I've been well received and the Lord has been has greatly blessed. I still do have trials and difficulties, but none that cannot be conquered without Christ. As of today, the Lord has given me sobriety for over six years. And God has given me employment in serving Him and others for over five years now. And just recently, a little over two years ago, I was married to a beautiful lady that the Lord had been saving from. <laughs> this goes to attest the great glory and power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not to bring me glory, but to show how he could redeem a wretch like me. And how he could use someone like me as a tool for his saving cause. Now the time to share my favorite Bible promises here, and we will see from this Bible verse that just as I have kept my promise about sharing this favorite Bible verse, that so does God keep His promises. My favorite Bible verse is Proverbs 22, 6. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he will go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Brothers and sisters, this is my favorite verse. Because my parents adhered to the first part of the verse, the training up of the child. Because if they did that and they did their job, God brought to pass the latter part that says, He will, when he is old, not depart from it. As I return to my childhood upbringing. Brothers and sisters, I want to share with each and every one of you that this book right here has promises for every single one of us. And God has promised that he wants to receive us home. With him, just like the story of the prodigal son. And to make this story even a little more personal, I just found out something while I was here visiting the Hanushka family. Um, Brother Dalibor shared with me a testimony about my father that I didn't know. Uh, he told me that about 13 years ago, he was visiting my home. And uh, I wasn't anywhere to be seen because I was up doing whatever I was doing. And uh, my father told him, a little personal story. My father didn't really open up personally so much, but he told him, he said, you know, he said something like, I love my son very much and I want to tell you a story. And my father said one day he was at a gas station. My father was at a gas station 
and he was putting gas and he was thinking about me. Maybe he just had a phone call for me. Maybe I'd just come out of jail or just had a near death experience. And my father started crying. And that's really rare because my father didn't show much emotion like tears. And my father started crying and he told Brother Dalibor that a woman came up to him that he never saw in his life. She looked him in the eyes and she said, don't worry, he will be saved. Brother Dalibor thought that was interesting. Maybe took some thought to it, but maybe didn't think how serious it was. But he told me years later when I came back to the Lord, he realized that that might have been an angel or who knows, giving hope to my father. Um, can you imagine the joy on that beautiful resurrection day as me and my earthly father embrace with the realization of God's precious promises? Amen. Brothers and sisters and young people, before I close this program today, I want to ask you if you like stories. Does anybody like stories? Yeah? Okay. I know this was kind of like a story. Do you mind if I close with another short story? Is that okay? Okay. So this is a story, and um, this was about a man. This was about a man, and this man, he, he had done something terribly wrong. And he had to go to prison for many, many years, about 15 years. And because of what he had done, his family cut him off. And he had offended his family greatly. So he had offended his family. They cut him off. And he was in prison. So he didn't even communicate with his family. He didn't write to them. He didn't try to contact them because they had cut him off. And after 15 years of being in prison, he was being released. And guess what his first thought was when he was being released? Guess where he wanted to go? Home. He wanted to go home. He wanted to go back to his family. But he didn't know if they would accept him. So he didn't even write to them. But you know what? The last day right before he got out of the prison, he said, you know what? The only thing I want is to go home. Otherwise, life is not worth living. So he said, you know what I need to do? I need to write my family a letter. But because he didn't have time to wait for the response, he wrote his family and said, Please forgive me. I love you so much. Forgive me for what I've done. I'm getting released from prison today. More than anything in my life, I want to come home. But I don't know if you will accept me. And I don't want to come home if you don't accept me. I don't have time for a response. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, because I'm going to be passing by on the bus. And I want to ask you that if you will accept me home, will you please put a yellow ribbon outside the window so that when I pass the, the home, I can know whether or not I should stop. If I don't see the yellow ribbon, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep going. But if I see the yellow ribbon, I notice you're going to accept me home. And so he was on the bus two, three days, had traveled. He was on the other side of the country. He gets nearer and nearer his, his previous home. His anticipation is terrible because he doesn't deserve to be forgive, forgiven. And he, he's about to come around the corner. And he's about to be devastated because he doesn't believe that there will be a yellow ribbon out the window. He comes around the corner, he, he's ready for rejectment, and he looks at his old home, and he sees a yellow ribbon out of the window. He sees a yellow ribbon on the chimney. He sees a yellow ribbon on the mailbox. He sees a yellow ribbon on the tree. He sees a yellow ribbon on the flagpole, on the light post. He sees hundreds of yellow ribbons all flooding the yard, saying, come home, come home. Brothers and sisters and young people, I want to share with you today that some of you may have never been through an experience that I've been through with drugs or these kind of things. But I know each and every one of us has maybe had an experience in our life where we have done something where we something comes in between us and whom? Us and God. So in reality, 
if we let that thing separate us. We're not at home. And I want you to know that Jesus, every single day when we wake up, when we open our eyes, when we look at the birds and we see the sun in the sky, and we look at our children and our wives and our parents and our family, the Lord gives us millions of yellow flags. And he's telling us, come home, come home. And so I want to make an appeal today. If you were touched by this story, and you might have let something get in between your way, God, whatever it is, don't let the pride stop you. You know, it might be something like success, money, could even be your children. Do not our children get in between us and God sometimes? We maybe love them more. Whatever it is, I don't know what it is. Maybe your love of dress or your pride of your occupation. could be anything. I don't know what it is. Each and every one of us has something that separated us between God. And I want to make an appeal. Now is the time to rededicate our life to the Lord. And so those of you that would like, please come up and we're going to have a special prayer of rededication. Now I'm the one who's physically making this appeal, but it's not me speaking. It's the Lord speaking with through me. So if you have the desire to come up and you refuse, you're not refusing me. You're refusing the Holy Spirit. So, once again, want to make an appeal. Those of you that want to rededicate your life to the Lord, come forward. Come forward. And we want to have a special prayer. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Jesus is calling, brothers and sisters, come home. Come home. It could be anything. Anything. Come home. Come home. Amen. Amen. Come forward. At this time, I'm going to ask Brother Doreen. He's a your worker here and a, and a special love brother. That as we kneel down and as we ask the Lord to um, to have this special time of rededication, as we decide to come home fully once again today, that He may ask a special blessing. Brother Pastor Doreen may ask a special blessing on our desires and wishes. Our God and Father, which art in heaven, at this very moment, we come before thee. We don't know, Lord, the best way, but we come in a simple way. I know you have touched our hearts and souls. And I ask you that you would help us and all of those that are present, all of those that came up to rededicate their lives, that we can look into the future, that we can look at you and feel and see that you are near to bless, to forgive, to accept, and I strongly believe that now is the time to come home. Thank you, Lord, for the amazing, wonderful experience of Brother Daniel. Thank you for the prayers of his parents and what it took until he came home. And we ask for all of those that are present and not present in the local church, in our field, in many other parts, for all those parents that are praying for sons and daughters. You know their faith, their tears. And we ask you, Lord, that you touch their hearts. Be with us as we rededicate our lives and help us to get liberated from this bondage of sin and slavery. Help us all that by feeling your love and coming close to me, we would never depart. We would never desire that we would find a new master and a new home. We thank you once again for all of these words and for the amazing experience. Touch 
everyone's heart and all of those that have been at the crossroads to dedicate their lives to make a covenant through baptism. Yes, and we pray for all of those that have in mind and in plans for this year. We know, Lord, that the enemy will try to stop, will try to hinder, and would say, don't be foolish to go with these people, enjoy this life. But we understand the true meaning of joy and happiness is only with you. We ask all of these things, and please bless everyone that came up, and all of those present, with a double, double blessing. Visit us with the Holy Spirit, and we believe that you are speaking to us today. I pray and ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I just wanted to make a short <coughs> suggestion that um, for those of you, young people, or those that maybe um, somehow have departed, or that the Lord has touched your heart, um, if, if you were blessed, and young people, you're coming to the age, 17, 18, and you were considering giving your heart to the Lord, um, um, this is, you know, the perfect time to come and talk with, uh, we have here several workers, Brother Doreen, Pastor Marian, uh, myself, we would be happy to talk with you and uh, to help you um, in a non-judgmental way to make a decision for baptism. Jesus wants you to come to him and to give all everything right now. So even if it's something that you don't think you're ready, but you feel the, the tugging of the Holy Spirit, feel welcome to come and talk to us at any time. Amen. Thank you, Brother Danny, for that message. It was great to be up here with my brother. Um, at this time, we're going to collect our uh, tithes and offerings, so we're good to have the ushers come forward. Father, thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you for bringing us all here on the Sabbath day that we can worship you and come close to you. Please bless the offering that was just collected and that can be used towards your honor and glory. Thank you for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, we'll sing our final hymn while we're standing. Hymn number 20 in your book, Blueprints to Happiness. Number 20, None of Self and all of thee. I just wanted to share real quick, um, before we sing this song, um, I, I'm not sure if my Uncle Charles is watching in California, but um, this is a very special song to me. Uh, after I came back to the Lord, I was at his home, my Uncle Charlie and Marlene Baldeck, and uh, they sang this song, and it just touched me because it really applied to me, um, where the verse says, uh, when, when we start coming to the, to the Lord, you know, it's all of self and none of thee. It's all about me and none of Jesus. But as he works on us with his Holy Spirit, then we give a little bit. Some of self and some of thee. Less of self and more of thee. Until at last he conquers. And none of self 
and all of thee. I just want to share that's a real special song. Mm -hmm.